Right. Hi. Uh, yes, pretty fancy room. Uh, congratulations for the uh, six billion pound Manchester. It's a bit of inflation after the six million dollar man, so uh, you are doing better, but it's a whole city, so it's understandable. Um, I'm supposed to be giving kind of an overview of what's going on in the uh, civic innovation field at the moment. Uh, I'll basically touch three topics uh, which I think are actually happening nowadays, becoming studied to be happening in the same organizations. Uh, the open data, open interfaces movement, then the laboratories for civic innovation, and uh, lastly, the uh, reboot of the smart cities. I mean, how and these things are uh, all joining forces in places like uh, laboratory for the city in, in Mexico. Um, first, uh, where I come from, I lead the uh, City of Helsinki Innovation Lab for Virium Helsinki. I won't be talking about that, and I won't be talking about European Network of Living Labs either, but just that you know the organization I'm linked to. Enol is the uh, largest international network for user-driven innovation uh, labs. Uh, we have uh, currently about 150 active members, and through the history, it's been uh, over 300 labs which have been active in Enol at some point during the past uh, eight years, since uh, uh, 2000 and some things, empowering everyone to innovate. I think that's maybe the uh, talk of the day. That's what we are talking about here. How can we empower everyone to innovate? Is it realistic? Is it a stupid idea? Does everyone want to innovate in the first place? Um, I'm originally an architect, and it's taken me some time to learn that the cities are not about buildings. As I was taught to think about cities as structures, buildings. Uh, cities are more, far more fundamentally about change. City of uh, Manchester of tomorrow will be diff very different from Manchester of today. Uh, that's one of the only things we know for sure, but that's what's going to be happening. Cities change. And it's hard to design any fixed structures and systems for cities because they change. That uh, explains some of the catastrophic uh, decisions by, uh, by engineering in the past decades, like uh, building highways in US cities. Uh, you make an assumption, and then the city changes, and it actually turns your innovation uh, into a way to, to create more traffic congestion instead of getting rid of it which was the original plan of the highways. And uh, I also am a quite big disbeliever in the uh, overarching operating systems for cities. I mean, how do you build an operating system for a society? It's utterly more complex than any company or any organization. The city is us, and you can't build an operating system for us. You can build connecting systems which are linked when needed, but the complexity of an overarching uh, operating system actually turns the system into an unrelevant, simplified mock uh, caricature of the city. Oh, so uh, it, cities are about change and then they are about people. I mean, if there are no people, there's no city. And people tend to make a mess of the city, and that's the uh, trouble with the city planners, that they, people never do what we think they do. But then again, people are the gasoline, the uh, fuel for the city. We as species are created by nature. We do things together. That's how we work. And we see urban innovations popping up. That's a restaurant day in a uh, study from Helsinki. Restaurant day is a simple concept using the, the uh, searchable city concept. So we come from browsable city. When you come to a new place, that's a browsable city. Without the, uh, before the digital days, you came to Manchester, you started to walk on the streets. It was like browsing the internet before we had search. And now we are in the searchable city, where we can find things in a totally foreign place, in a location which we never thought of, we never could have found but with, uh, provided by uh, interactive tools, now we can find them. A whole pop-up phenomenon is based on a browsable city idea. And restaurant day is a browsable city concept in which the city turns four times a year into a big, big restaurant. So anyone can open a restaurant. It was originally a protest movement towards the too strict 
restaurant legislation of Finland, so just a group of people decided that what happens if we open 100 pop-up restaurants at the same time? Can the police come to all of them? And no, they couldn't. And now it's turned into sort of a allowed form of civic activism in which the health authorities of Finland go like this, and everybody's having a restaurant, selling food, alcohol to their peers in their living rooms, in gardens, etc. Last restaurant day, we had, I think, 240 or something restaurants in Helsinki popping up in every street corner. And these kind of things are happening in cities, and the question is, how can the city, as an organization, how could, can we support that and uh, take advantage of the uh, tremendous power of community creation? Uh, the challenge for cities is that uh, we have lots of old legacy processes, technology, ways of doing things. Uh, there are things which most of the cities think that it's their particular fault. When I go to a new city to discuss how you are doing civic innovation, they said, you know, uh, we have this huge problem that our city is very siloed. Our city is very siloed and the departments don't discuss. Well, every city, each and every one, is siloed. It happens to be the way Barbieras Mansion has, over the decades and centuries, built itself. And uh, it would, maybe wasn't a problem before, because you could just walk from one department to the other, but now when we use different means to interact, it's, it's, it feels awkward I have to, that I have to have like 10 different digital means to interact with the city of Helsinki. I mean, we have 19 different login systems at the moment in, in Helsinki alone. And old legacy surprise, it gets surprised by the speed of, uh, of the internet and urban innovations. Most urban innovations don't come from the cities. They come from uh, entrepreneurs, SMEs, startups who play around in a city. Airbnb is a good example. Uh, it's grown at internet speed. And it's one of the examples of service platforms which are coming to accommodation, tourism information, point of interest information, transport, probably healthcare and well-being pretty soon, which roam from one city to the other. And because they roam at internet speed, they grow very fast. Airbnb didn't exist a few years back, and now it's bigger than uh, any hotel chain in the world. You can get accommodation in uh, 40, 34,000 cities through the platform, and they, have, they own nothing except the platform. So the uh, lateral way to do services using the internet as the, uh, as the tool is really, really efficient to come up with a very fast growing and very competitively priced services compared to the old way in which you would have to buy 34,000 hotel rooms. The challenge is that the cities have a tough time dealing with this. That's the uh, drone which uh, fell to the White House lawn a few months back. And there's no law which forbids anyone to fly a drone around the White House. Because, I mean, there were no drones like two years back. And before there's a law to forbid that, it'll take time. So how do we cope with the speed of new innovations coming to our cities, which are potentially hazardous? I mean, it could have carried a bomb. And uh, one thing we can't do is try to stop it. It's the uh, history of technology. As, as inno innovation has proved that there's no way to stop something, a new development, when it takes off. So we, learn, we should learn to, learn to cope with this. And uh, now there's a contradiction in the talk which I'll say out loud, I totally believe in civic innovation as grassroots action which has to take place in your city, has to grow from your city. But at the same time, any city as a platform it is far too small to actually build very sustainable solutions. So we need solutions which grow out of communities which are adapted by local communities, but, but which also scale from one city to the other. So how do we link these different 
pop-up activities, different civic activities from different countries and different cities into larger entities, which makes it possible for the solutions to scale up. Because Helsinki is a tiny marketplace, Manchester is a tiny marketplace. Uh, you can't make a living with a Manchester app. But you could if you had a damn good app which would work in Manchester, Helsinki, Paris, London, San, San Francisco, wherever. So even though our innovations need to be growing from the local communities, actually the challenges the cities have, have are not unique and those can be and should be, we should be stealing stuff from each other and then to work with the local community to see how we do it here. Cities are like, I said that cities are like old couples. They think that they have unique problems. But when you go to marriage counseling, you notice that actually you are just like any other couple. Have you been in marriage counseling? <laughs> I, I, have, I have, yeah. So it was, it was very relieving that our problems were just very typical and uh, they heard it a million times before and they had ready-made solutions for them. It was comforting. And cities are the same. There are lots of stuff out there which works for your city. But cities always want to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, some things uh, which are happening, three things. First, civic hackers and openness. So that's, that's, a, that's your home turf. UK has been leading, leading in open data. So, uh, open data clearing houses, yes. We need those, that's the Helsinki region info shell. We have 1,250 data sets open now. And it's, it works, it creates new apps, it creates business intelligence. And it does that especially when you connect it to developer collaboration. Helsinki Last Developer is a program which we run to link with the developer community and to crowdsource information of which data do you actually want, which interfaces should we open, uh, which sucks, which doesn't. How can we help you? And uh, what we see popping up now are, of course, different app ad hack competitions. Apps for Europe is having its meeting now in Manchester and giving, giving uh, prizes for best European app, apps. And App Circus is a Barcelona-based concept to uh, to uh, boost up app development in cities, combination of hackathons and, and competitions. And then we have the Code for Anything programs. Starting with the Code for America originally, in which you embed people who can do apps code in the government. And they form a network which is stronger than any one of them individually in the uh, in whichever city they might be working for, for a short period of time. And then they form a bigger repository over time, bigger repository of open, open source code, open source apps, on which new fellows, new data fellows, code fellows, can build new solutions. And all these things work. And I think the key point it really isn't, did our app competition create good application this round? The big thing is that all of these activities, they form the community in your city. That's the real outcome. You might get things like Blind Square, which came out of Apps for Finland two years back, which is a fantastic audio app for the blind people, and it's growing fast, so yes, we have a beautiful business case. But we also, and for more fundamentally, we have, and in this case, New York has the community which has learned to work together to solve the civic issues in their city code fellows, app developers, people who open the data, civil servants, who learn to know each other and work together. And that has been for us one of the key things we found out, that you never work with organizations. You always work with people. Organizations don't collaborate, people do. So we are exceedingly using models in which we bring city of Helsinki people into our office and we embed our people in Helsinki and other cities to really work together in shared issues. Second thing which we see now is labs of all kinds. Well, we see examples here today, so I won't be going through a million of them. Uh, Living Labs was one of the first moments in this, this area. Uh, quite diverse bunch 
of labs from purely technology driven to very civic innovation driven laboratories. Future everything is a living lab. So you're part of the network. And living labs are now popping up in related to urban design, related to service design, service de design thinking, and uh, quite strongly also in well-being sector because finally healthcare people have understand that it's better to design services for people so that they actually involved in the process. I mean, you never would design skis without having skiers in the process, but yes, we do design services without having the end users in the process. And examples of that, there's a GovLab, which is the governance lab of, uh, from New York, who uh, do prototyping, build, then they train civil servants and their own developers. They learn through the shared processes, and especially they work as a glue, connecting different stakeholders together. And we have uh, Barcelona as a lab, so a very ambitious idea to turn, turn the whole city into an innovation laboratory, led by the uh, head of innovation, Ines Carriga, in Barcelona. And they have experimented that already in a city lab concept, where they have opened the cityscape for SME, so they can do different pilots and tests using the actual city as a playground. And the World Bank is adapting the idea as well to they see that the urban living lab could be the solution which would be multiplied in different cities across the globe to build connections which often are very even, even harder to build in developing countries than in developed countries between the government and the civil society, between the academia and private sector, acting as a, this neutral Luxembourg in the middle who can bring these stakeholders together. And third area is then the smart cities done right. Uh, it's, uh, I'm frustrated with the smart cities because the concept was, is so, so tempting and of course it's done totally wrong the first, the first round. So it does need a reboot. And why? Well, uh, smart cities as we know it now, things places like Masdar or Rio de Janeiro, uh, uh, control center uh, under the city with the people wearing helmets, they are very typical technology push projects. The challenge with that is that in for most cities, technology push is not the solution. You don't solve the problems of Mumbai by embedding lots of sensors in Mumbai. You don't solve challenges in uh, Kibera, in Kenya, which is the big an unplanned area in the middle of the city by giving them uh, uh, better technological tools. The only thing which is there is basically the community. So you need to work with what you have and what you have is the people. And same is true for cities in which we live. We don't start our making Manchester smarter by tearing down everything we have and starting from a greenfield situation like the smart city thinkers like to think. So the uh, technologically driven smart city is a very rare case. Most cities you have to retrofit and uh, work with the people. So here it comes to the civic innovation field. So the right, right way to do smart cities basically equals civic innovation labs. Because then we can connect the user interfaces which are omnipresent. We have user interfaces in our pockets uh, and the cr creativity of the people to come up with new urban innovations. That's a cleaning day. It's the uh, brother of the restaurant day. So it's the day in which uh, the whole city turns into a big flea market. 1,500 of them the last time it was organized. Flea markets are all over the place. You can work as communities, as partners, as your solvers. And the city should be the enablers of that phenomena. There are some things which the city owns as services, but it monitors what happens in the cityscape, and it can drive and support things they find valuable, and stop doing something by themselves if it's done better by the people, by the community. Uh, 
But then we come to this challenge of interoperability. That's the IT system of a typical city. That's how they look like. And the uh, interoperability even within that is almost impossible. So how do you build services which can roam from one city to the other when it's very hard to do it even within one city? And a quickly, uh, one case of this in which Future Everything was a partner called City SDK, City Service Development Kit, in which we built open interfaces to tourism, citizen feedback, and transport in eight cities in Europe with basically simple idea. What can we do to make it easier to, for developers to build services for Manchester so that they work in Rome and Istanbul? And open APIs was the thing we tried, and yes, it works. So we built mobility API, we built tourism API for point of interest information, and APIs for participation. And not services, not end products, but the interface between the city backend systems and the developers. So that developers then built the apps, and we got lots of that. I, lost one slide here, so I will be showing an example, but anyway, there's a nice Metro Magazine feedback app for citizen feedback. And I think that has led us to think that uh, for cities, how the cities should think about their services is uh, that there should be one service for everybody. There should be bring your own service model. BIOS, bring your own service. Because you can't have the same apps for the kindergartens of Helsinki and the slaughterhouse. So, I mean, a massive ERP for the city is a stupid idea. There's two little common denominators between different departments. But you can have a backbone in which you plug your own unique different services. So architecturally, instead of thinking a city is like that, tightly coupled systems, you should think it like that, like the internet, loosely coupled systems, in which you link the services when needed. Most of the times, they are not linked. So I close then uh, with a final question, which is that when we talk about civic innovation, uh, that's an old slide from a living lab set in which we still talked about users then. Uh, and it makes sense to ask who are the users, because people are different. And I close with the equation. That's from Anthea Watson, strong, uh, and it's lended from William Riker and Peter Oreshok from 1968, so it's an old equation. And that's the equation of participation. And that's something to keep in mind. So why should, would people, and when do people participate? P is the probability. Is something going to happen if I participate? Is something going to happen if I join this thing? B is the benefit, what's in it for me? And if either of those is zero, people don't do anything, I mean, you, because the equation equals zero then. If there's no probability that something happens, people don't do a thing, or if there's nothing for them in there, people don't do a thing. There's a great example of that, the Finnish government asked the Finnish people about what they would like to see from digital healthcare services. The whole of Finland, 5.2 million people, we are not many, but still, uh, the whole of Finland gave them 38 answers. And why? There was absolutely no probability that anything would happen if they had their say about digital healthcare systems. There were no program for digital healthcare systems. There were no ideas or funding for digital healthcare systems. So why would people invest their time? And D is duty, and that's the problem with us, because we have this sense of duty that we should do our task as civic society actors, but regular people necessarily are not that emburdened with duty. They don't think that is their job, really, to participate. So if you take probability times benefit and add duty to that, that should be bigger than the cost. And the cost for people can be money, especially it's time, it's effort. And I think that job for us as civic innovation labs is to think of all of these aspects. Can we lower the cost? If it's easier to participate, if it's easier to join, if you are helped, that lowers the cost. Can we increase the sense of duty? Make people understand why this is important, why they should care how their cities are. Can we make benefits clearer? And especially, 
can we increase the probability, which means that we can get a promise from the cities, from the government, that yes, if people participate, something will happen. So uh, with that, I close. Sorry for going a bit over time. I don't know how much, five minutes or so. Thanks. Thank you.